Yeah, and thank you everyone for, for coming to this session. Uh, the, I don't know how to explain the title. I'll launch right in. The structure of my talk is given on the first slide. I'm going to skip over some pieces. Um, the modeling section six, I'll skip over. Um, you can find that. I'll show you where in a minute if you want to look at it, but I'm going to try and get to the basic ideas involved and items of dispute. OK, this draws on three works of mine. Um, one is the uh, University of Chicago Press book from Pleasure Machines to Moral Communities, which was published in 2013. The following year, there was an article in the Journal of Evolution Economics, The Evolution of Morality and the End of Economic Man, same title. That's the piece that's got the modeling in it. So if you want to look at the modeling in, special, in particular, uh, look at that. I'll briefly explain what the modeling is about, but I won't go into detail. That will save time. And more recently, um, a slightly broader book on uh, political and moral and philosophical issues called Liberal Solidarity 2021 Albert Alga. And I go into the issue about mor moral motivation in that book too. OK, um, 1871 and all that. Um, any historian of economic thought will tell you that the idea all happened in one year or even in one decade is quite wrong, but I'll skip over that. It's just a lot of people do say that 1871, when two major books in economics appeared, signaled the marginal revolution. More sophisticated historians of thought will know things happened along those lines before, and it took several years afterward to consolidate that. But be that as it may, we've got these two great books by William Stanley Jevons, um, the picture of him there, and also by Carl Menger. Quite different arguments, but they do centre on some common themes, both coming out in 1871, and they're seen as foundational, along with later work by Varas, Leon Varas, and particularly by Marshall, for the rise of what you might call marginalist or neoclassical economics, which characterizes, still characterizes uh, much of the basic economic paradigm today. OK, crucial year then is 1871. Uh, people often forget that um, with this idea of self interested utility in maximizing man. But Charles Darwin in the same year also published The Descent of Man. And um, the, the two sets of books have not been often compared, but there's clearly a refutation or an attempt in Darwin's work when he considers human groups and human morality uh, to say that hum humans have evolved dispositions to cooperate. Um, there's some nuance I want to just introduce here. Uh, while Menger and Jevons emphasize self-interest, um, that isn't strictly necessary for utility maximization. Uh, you can have other regarding preferences, as they're called today, which would um, reduce or put less of an accent on self-interest, as people put it, and just simply utility maximization, which could include, altru for example, altruistic behavior. So it's a bit, a bit crude because the argu arguments uh, that Darwin put um, are directed against self-interested paper, but also I think he goes... Um, a little bit against utilitarianism as well. Anyway, why is the evolution of morality important? Well, no society or economy can function without moral bonds and rules uh, of some nature and by some means. Uh, I would personally take the position that we are motivated by greed and by moral sentiments. And I would argue, and I've argued in several places, including the works I showed you earlier, that Moral sentiments um, are necessary for human survival, and greed also plays a part, but we, our motivation is a complex combination and perhaps a varying combination of these two elements. So we need to look at both the nature of human nature, and we also need to look at morality itself. Um, and I'll start with that. What is morality? Now, there's um, uh, 
um, a big discussion going on um, about the nature of morality in philosophy. It's not reached any clear consensus conclusions. There are a lot of controversies about things within this, but I want to extract what I think are some key messages that something like 80 or 90 percent of ethical philosophers would agree about. So if you get hold of a textbook on Ethics 101, it'll make this distinction between one, two and three, that the ethical claims uh, or moral claims uh, have different characteristics and different ways of justifying themselves or claiming to be persuasive. You can focus on the consequences. In other words, a act is seen as moral because it has good consequences or um, it, it leads to outcomes which are beneficial or whatever. Um, that's a con so you've basically whatever the consequences are and whatever criteria you use to assess the current consequences, the focus is on those, on the consequences. And this includes most brands of utilitarianism, including utility maximizing economic man, because if you use that as a welfare criterion, as is done in mainstream economics, you're focusing on consequences, particularly some criterion uh, according to utility maximization, like the Pareto criterion is, is one a common possibility. But that um, uh, we shouldn't overlook. There's two other big schools of ethical thinking around virtue and ethics and deontology. Virtue ethics, often associated with Aristotle and others, is about virtue, as the game suggests. In other words, the ethical claims are very much about arguments about being virtuous in some sense. Uh, deontology literally means related to duty. In other words, obligation for some reason, either due to religion or the survival of the group or whatever it is, we have a duty to do X and that duty based argument is seen as important to establish ethics. Again, without spending too much time on this, um, I would suggest we need all three. I think to focus on one or two alone um, is limited. I would suggest a rather pragmatic approach to ethics where we compare different uh, aspects of an ethical claim and use all three criteria. But obviously, we should not focus on one alone. And this is in contrast to standard utilitarianism. I'm not going to talk about varieties of it, but focusing on the kind of utilitarianism we get in economics, in welfare economics, it's a version of consequentialism alone. Virtue and deontology don't come into the argument. Right, let, I now raising the issue of altruism and altruistic behavior. Again, there's a huge literature here. I'm going to suggest there's an overlap between moral acts and altruistic acts. In other words, according to most uh, moral systems or moralities, if you like, altruism is part of the story, but it's not the whole story. But let's focus on altruism for a minute. Comte, uh, the, the French sociologist, invented the term altruism and defined it very, very loosely as living for others, um, which is not an adequate definition. Um, there's been commentaries on altruism by many philosophers, including in particular Nagel and Green, and they insist, as Comte seemed to as well, the altruistic behavior involved behavior which had a risk or a cost to the individual being altruistic, behaving in an altruistic way. So this element of cost is seen as crucial. In other words, if you're doing, if, if an act is without potential cost to the individual, then uh, for these philosophers, you could question its description as being altruistic, even though it looks kind. So as Nagel says, a defense of altruism in terms of self-interest is unlikely to be successful. Now, he doesn't draw this conclusion, but that obviously reflects on um, economics and the idea of um, utility maximizing so-called economic man. Um, much of the discussion of that in economics, not all of it, but much of it is uh, premised on the idea that we have to 
uh, understand or manipulate or create in utility functions where altruistic behavior is possible. But ultimately, as I'll expand in a minute, this is basing it on self-interest, even though there's other, other regarding preferences, the individual is still maximizing his or her own welfare. And this really expresses a concern about altruistic modeling and altruistic understandings within a Max U framework. So we can raise the question, this guy, Max U, this famous utility maximizer, who came to prominence at the end of the 19th century and the economics of the people I mentioned before, uh, is he an altruist? Uh, well, I would say he's not a genuine altruist. Uh, and uh, because he's always acting selfishly, even if he's acting for others or to the advantage of others, his purpose, I use the male gender here, his purpose is always to maximize his own utility. And this is a criticism of this very interesting and well-written book by Samuel Bowles, where he not only conflates or draws together altruism and morality in rather a crude way, but actually tries to uh, understand altruism in a utility maximizing framework. And the consequence of that, there's never a cost in terms of utility. So I would say that w one of the things wrong with Sam, Sam Bowles' book is that it understands altruism in a way that does not involve costs. Um, e e even if it may be effort by the altruist, Max U altruist, there's ultimately no cost because Max U gets utility from acting in that particular way. Okay, so that would be part of my criticism of Sam Bowles' book. I don't think it's adequate to talk about what he calls the moral economy, very important issue, but it's not adequate to talk about it in utilitarian terms alone, max, max U terms alone. It's focusing in too much and too exclusively on consequences. David, as I assume I saw, saw, just saw it coming to the audience, I'll be interested in your reply. Also I read a very interesting book called Does Altruism Exist? A lot of things I agree with in this book, but I disagree with one part of it. So David discusses altruism. And he makes a distinction between altruism defined in terms of action and altruism defined in terms of thoughts or feelings. Um, I'm less concerned about that distinction. I'm more concerned about the moral implications here, but let's carry on. And David argues thoughts and feelings ultimately need to be judged in terms of what they cause people to do. Well, I'll try and counter this with an example, um, an imaginary fictional story. Um, this consequentialism, I think, is inadequate, particularly when we that it uh, a story like this. A young man is helpful and affectionate towards a rich old widow. OK, he does lots of things for her, he brings some happiness to the final years of her life. But in truth, he's interested solely in the possibility that he inherits her riches in her will. His intentions are such, they may be not evident to an observer, but those are his two intentions. He brings her comfort and joy. The outcomes, the consequences are positive, at least for her, but arguably his motives are not generally altruistic. And I'd also question the moral issue here, I and mean, what, what whether this is moral or not is not is a different matter. But can we judge moral behaviour solely by consequences? Either, we, I would suggest we can't judge altruism solely by consequences, and likewise we cannot we can't judge moral behaviour solely by consequences. So we do need to bring intention to the story, and I think if somehow we found out or knew or surmised that this young man's uh, behavior was motivated by um, a, a greedy concern, a manipulative and greedy concern to get her wealth, I think we would take a different judgment about it. So in short, I think thoughts or feelings cannot be discarded in this case, at least. Now, I now face this minefield of trying to summarize modern philosophy or modern ethics in terms of what, what, what morality means. 
I, I'm not going to do justice to this, but I, what I'm going to do is quote three people, um, two of which are, are very prominent moral philosophers of the 20th century. Um, Heyer, for example, um, in his famous book on morality, he makes the point that, amongst others, morality is subject to reason. Therefore, one cannot hold contradictory ethical judgments. If one does, one has to disentangle that inconsistently consistency and move towards a consistent position. So that is one important side of the story, that ethical judgments have a rational basis to them, reasoning, deliberation, and so on. Uh, and I think that should be taken on board. And then Mackey, which has his own distinct position, which actually in substance I don't agree with, but he makes a good point here. A moral judgment is not purely descriptive, certainly not inert, but something that involves a call for action or from the refraining from action than one that is absolute, not contingent upon any desire of preference or policy of choice, his own or anyone else's. Now, those kind of ideas, both by Hare and by Mackey, are actually quite common in standard um, eth eth ethics. A lot of philosophers, a lot of ethical philosophers would agree with them. Um, turning to Mackey's in more detail, this idea that is not descriptive and it goes, it has an absolute character in, you know, in such circumstances, you'd always do this or always do that. And it's also separable from desire or preference or policy or choice. It's not simply because I say, say it's a good idea. So I believe in a moral framework and therefore, according to this moral framework, one should act in this way or refrain from acting in that way. This is absolutism, uncontingent feature of morality, which is also very important. And, and these tend to undermine a standard uh, utilitarian approach to morality as we find in economics. I think an even better summary is in a book by Richard Joyce, um, which is on, on evolutionary theories of morality, which I thoroughly recommend because it goes into details about evolutionary explanations and the role of evolution in uh, uh, evolutionary processes, Darwinian evolutionary processes in the evolution of human moral belief systems. So he lists a number of things, I'm more or less paraphrasing or reproducing them here. The moral judgments express attitudes, that's the first feature that they have generally. And then secondly, the emotion of guilt is an important mechanism for regulating moral conduct. So there's an emotional part of the story which we've inherited through culture and or through genes um, to actually uh, feelings of guilt when we break moral codes. We may learn that as children, wherever it comes from, it's a strong component in a human moral system. Thirdly, like Mackey's point earlier, moral judgments transcend the interests and ends of those concerned. It's not about your own interests or your own ends, it's about what you believe to be moral in a broader sense. Implying notions of desert and justice. Moral judgments are inescapable. In other words, you can't claim that because you're rich or famous or in the elite or of royal blood that you are not subject to a moral, moral claim. Six, moral judgments transcend human conventions, not about conventions, not about an equilibrium and a repeated game, which happens to be a greater rule which people can conform to. It may be that, but if, if, if it is, it's much more than that because it's not simply a, a convention that um, like driving on the left or driving on the road. It, French drivers are not immoral because they drive on the right hand side. If, if, if a French driver comes to Britain and drives on the right hand side, they will be arrested or have a an accident, um, which is an adverse con consequence. And, and driving on the left or right is a convention. It's not a moral issue. Uh, obeying the law may be a moral issue, but that's not the same thing. Moral judgments govern interpersonal relations and counter self regarding individualism. I've quoted uh, David Sloan Wilson, Wilson earlier. I quote with approval the work he's done on this, particularly on Darwin's Cathedral and other, uh, other publications where David shows by looking at religion in particular, that, that, that moral codes have this particular strong function and are important for these and other reasons. Now, the preceding points is, is about the nature of a moral judgment, not what is a valid moral judgment. 
So this is in the realm of descriptive ethics rather than normative ethics. And I should emphasize that point. I'm not trying to say normatively what an ethical or moral system should be. I'm simply trying to distinguish at this point between what is and what is not a moral judgment. So in that sense, uh, someone like Hitler had a morality, okay? And, and he had particular moral judgments about racial purity and all the rest of it, uh, which were part of his moral system. And so he held those along with other Nazis, of course. That is moral in the sense it's a moral judgment, but we would regard it Im immoral as immoral in uh, normative terms. Those two things are different. But, but even excluding at this point normative ethics simply talking about descriptive ethics we have a critique of utilitarianism because it focuses on consequences and it doesn't have the, the some of the characteristics which i noted earlier like um, not being simply a convention establishing norms which are or rules which are universal in character and so on and so there's a difference between a morality and a convention in particular. Now let's turn to, to Darwin. Now rem remark this is all from the descent of man. It's remarkable not only how sophisticated his arguments concerning group selection are, then it need obviously to be modernized, but uh, also in addition to that, about the talking about the mechanisms, um, is, is, is strictures on what we mean by being moral. Again, this is descriptive ethics, not normative ethics. It's what is the character of a moral being? For Darwin, it's, it's one who is capable of comparing his past and future actions or motive. This is the rational, reasonable, reasoning part of the story, which was raised earlier, and of approving or disapproving of them. We have no reason to suppose that any of the lower animals have this capacity, Man alone can be certain, certainly ranked as a, a, being a moral being. Now Darwin, of course, was cautious about this. He can't, uh, he has to explain how mor morality evolves. So there must be shades of gray in between not being a moral being and being a moral being. And he discusses those shades of gray uh, about deliberation in so-called lower animals and so forth. So I'm, I'm, I'm skipping over that, but I think it's important to note that he does consider it. Um, and then he talks about structures and rules within groups. Obedience is of the highest value for any form of government is better than none. Selfish and contentious people will not cohere, and without coherence, nothing can be effective. A tribe possessing the above qualities in a high degree would spread and be victorious over other tribes. And in, in particular about morality itself, a high standard morality gives but a slight or no advantage to each individual man and his children over other men in the same tribe. In other words, the advantage for the individual is not to necessarily be altruistic or moral, but the advantage is to the group. An advancement in the standard of morality will certainly give an immense advantage to one tribe over the other. The tribe, including many members who from possessing in a high degree the spirit of patriotism, fidelity, obedience, courage, and sympathy would always ready to give aid to each other and to sacrifice themselves for the common good would be victorious over most other tribes. And this will be natural selection. Now, I don't need to point this out to, to you that this is a group selection argument. There's a degree of controversy over it. But again, I would cite David, David Sloan Wilson's work and others, several others, which has importantly established the logic behind this kind of argument and um, uh, revived it from years of de decades of neglect. Um, I'm not going to go into that. I'm simply going to point out that Darwin here is putting a group selection argument for the evolution of morality. Morality grows not because of individual against individual, but tribe against tribe. And tribes where there's moral codes could would be victorious over other tribes. Um, so we know that this was seen as group selection and dismissed uh, and also seen as unfashionable. And then he, and um, he also against, went against the grain by arguing that human morality was based on social qualities acquired by the progenitors of man. What I mean by against the grain is that 
um, not so much amongst devolutionary thinkers in the 19th century, but amongst others, there was very much an assertion of human superiority uh, over others, uh, lower races, lower, lower animals and so on. And, and uh, Darwin was actually stressing connection, continuity and evolutionary uh, processes between them. Mentioned that. So uh, there's also another great uh, uh, article and works by Joseph Henry, um, where he distinguishes clearly between genetic and cultural group, group selection. This is uh, important for my argument, so I will remind you of what's going on here. Gen um, group selection is, is of groups in both cases. It's about the survival of uh, differential survival of different groups. But that can uh, have two kinds of not necessarily mutually exclusive, but two kinds of effect, genetic and cultural. Genetic group selection works through differences in uh, genetic distribution. Now, as a genetic distribution of genes within a group um, is, is less than the, the genetic distribution between groups. Um, and that those are the conditions under which it operates, and, and that's the definition of what we mean by it. Cultural group selection means that uh, variation within groups uh, culturally is less than variation between groups. So the key components and the mechanisms involved are different in those cases. Both mechanisms may operate, but th th they're defined differently. Different cultural and genetic mechanisms. Now, um, was, that summarizes the, Dar the Darwin point and adds some recent uh, clarifications. But we can already see a difference between Darwin on the left, uh, Huxley here, and you recognize him on the right, that's uh, Richard Dawkins. Uh, Darwin said human morality is evolved by natural selection of social qualities that dating from the progenitors of the man. In other words, he's applying his evolutionary theory to this aspect of humankind, which is having a morality. Compare that with Huxley, Huxley who actually says that, evil, that mor morality doesn't evolve in that way, denies that the ethical process, progress of society depends on combating natural selection. So much ethics, moral behavior does not emanate from uh, evolution, from Darwinian processes like selection, but depends on us combating evolution. And this very similar point is made by Dawkins. So we are born selfish, and anything that is evolved by natural selection should be selfish, but let us try and teach generosity and altruism. We alone, the earth, can rebel against the tyranny of the selfish replicators. Now, this has been well, well criticized, but I'll just remind you of some of the criticisms here. The first bit says we are born selfish. In other words, individuals are selfish. The second bit says the genes are selfish. Now they're not the same, as Dawkins himself knows when he talks about um, Hamilton-type processes of, of inclusive fitness, fitness, where the genes dispose, say, a bird in a flock of the birds to give a warning cry. Dawkins knows about that, but he slips, his language of the selfish gene slips into claims about us as individuals being selfish but it's not actually sustained by his own argument. So Dawkins' message is not only challengeable, it's also a bit of a mess. Anyway, moving on, uh, morality is more than skin deep. Well, what do we mean by that is that there's deep genetic and cultural mechanisms involved. And of course, we can regard genetic as being deeper than cultural, but they're both pretty well ingrained. Here you can cite the work of Franz de Waal on primates. Primates and Philosophers being one of his books. And this counters the Huxley-Dawkins veneer theory, as he calls it, of morality and presents evidence that primates are capable of sympathetic and corporate emotions. Now notice he, what he doesn't say is that uh, chimpanzees are moral beings. Like uh, he, he's in accord with Darwin here, who says that humans alone have this developed capacity. 
What he is doing, though, is if you like uh, exploring the missing link, is exploring the evolution of rules, uh, uh, engendering cooperation, and so on, without a developed language. Just to be some language amongst uh, primates, but without a, a, a developed language in the in the um, uh, to the level of humans. But it's kind of a step in between. Is is the basis or part of the basis of moral ev evolution? amongst humans proper. Um, so key factors for uh, Duval and others working in primatology prior to a full developed morality of the evolution of a conscience and related emotions such as shame and sympathy and argues that some primate groups exhibit these things. So culture alone cannot explain the origin of morality. Um, basically because you have to account for the existence of cultural norms, moral norms, and, and you cannot explain that by culture except by assuming what you have to explain. There's to be some process well, where they become emergent and important and re replicable in a culture. Um, and also another problem is that we consider the genetic group selection we find that uh, this is unlikely to have been a powerful mechanism for generating morality, because probably diminished by the fact of migration between primate groups, genetic mixing amongst chimpanzees, for example, females move from one group to another, and that creates genetic, genetic mixing. So the necessary variation between groups is, is, is diminished by, by mixing, and, and that creates a problem for explanations in solely genetic terms as well. So there's an interesting research issue which is still not resolved adequately. There's guesses, but I think we still need to work on it, is that how do we explain the evolution of morality given that both cultural group selection and genetic group selection have limitations. The best guess I would say is that the evolution of emotions amongst close kin later enhanced by cultural norms. This relates to the talk we had um, a few weeks ago by Samara Akosha, where he talked about these particular mechanisms. And, and um, we know that group selection and kin selection are, uh, and, uh, are actually formally related but the mechanisms can as kasha pointed out can be can be different um but creating a critical mass of people with a proto morality probably emerged within um close among close kin um that that would be a best guess and then it would uh, spread towards others um so you have the genetic mechanisms of kin altruism altruism trivers uh, Hamilton and Trevor's, and then morality spread further by cultural means. And once it actually gets going in humans, and it's helped by language and so on, which will maybe regarded as essential, then we get a cultural transmission of morality. But then we have another question, why among humans and not so much amongst other primates? If humans manage to do that uh, in groups and genetic relatedness created clusters of proto-moral thinking, and then this became enculturated and spread. Why couldn't this happen in other primates? So that becomes an important question too. And an answer to that is possibly Christopher Boom's uh, moral origins. And he focuses very much on big game hunting, um, which is quite early according to his, his, his view and uh, evidence. Um, a quarter of a million years ago, uh, early humans were actually hunting big things like mammoths and so on, as in the picture. And his argument is that the need to um, process and share the meat and the other products of big game hunting actually created a strong imperative to cooperate um, um, and develop means of, of rules and language to express that. Um, we're focusing on cultural processes, language, depends how we define this and what criteria, something like 100,000 years before the present is absolutely vital. Um, so the development of moral dispositions is, is necessarily a matter 
of both inherited value intuitions and personal development processes within a social and cultural community. In other words, educating children about moral norms and moral behaviour. Okay, very quickly skip this. I'm gonna have modeling the evolution of morality. There's an intrinsic interest in how we model this, but there's also another aim. This particular attempt by me in that article, which I referred to earlier, is an attempt to show that actually what Bowles and his colleagues were doing is not the same as what I would call the evolution of morality. Because they focus um, largely or completely on altruism and cooperating hearts and institutions. And, and I would suggest this needs to be enhanced by an understanding of moral motiv motivation. Now, I'm going to the details of the, of the model. I'm going to skip over that. I'm just going to show you the results. Um, the, the problem, one of the problems in the Bolzatown model is that they s focus entirely on genetic dispositions for altruism or otherwise and there's no cultural tr transmission at all in the story which i think for reasons i've already stated is absolutely essential um so what do we get we get um again going over the details i'm going to get to the diagram all, all this is available if you want to see this i can also send you the slides um you get these two columns uh, mor morality absent on the left and morality present on the right. In, in other words, what's going on here, excuse me, I have to go back, is that on the left, what I'm rep doing is replicating the model that, that Bowles and his colleagues did, which is a gene-based, entirely gene-based view of what altruism is, and processes of selection acting on those with the genes to be altruistic in certain ways. And they got this, um, Segmentation is the division of the whole species in different ways. Taxation is the capacity of the group to um, uh, share resources amongst themselves. And altruism is the average index of altruistic sen sentiments based in their case on the genes amongst that population. Now this uh, variation, a failure to stabilize and then a leap upwards which still is unstable, but can sustain itself for a while, but is subject to collapses, is a feature of all the runs they publish in their model. What I add in the rightmost column, morality present, is um, a, a cultural element where the, there's a cultural norms evolving, very crudely done in the model uh, with a few variables. And these moral norms pull up or press down people in particular directions regarding their behaviors and regarding their attitudes. So a someone who's born selfish can gradually, by being immersed in a more altruistic or cooperative culture, become more um, cooperative, despite their genetic disposition to be otherwise. And the result of this is you get a much stronger stabilizing feature the morality part of the graph here uh, goes up to a high level and remains reasonably stable. It's absent in the Bowles et al. model because it's solely about um, genetic dispositions. We have this group disposition, group property of degrees of moralness or moral climate in the group. And then comparing the two altruism things, which are both average individual propensities you get much greater stabilization possibly some collapses at, from times but it's much more stabilized uh, moral sensitivity again is not in the bolts thing moral sensitivity is the degree to which you are sensitive in your moral dispositions to the group in other words um if if, if the group is morally more morally has a moral climate a moral culture moral norms the individual, a sensitive individual, will move towards the group. And what this process does in my, mo my model is to uh, uh, select out and select those which are insensitive to the cultural climate and select in those that are sensitive to the cultural climate. 
And that again also helps to stabilize uh, moral norms in the group. Anyway, it's only a model, but I'm trying to show a conceptual difference between the kind of Bowles approach and, and um, uh, what I think is a richer moral argument. So final remarks uh, to wind up. What would an economics without economic man look like and where we would get the ideas from? Um, so, so point I made earlier, but worth repeating is early neoclassical economists assumed that in, in the economic sphere, they didn't actually say that there was necessarily everywhere. Self-interest was overwhelming and our altruistic monotenses could be ignored in the world of contract and business. That's unlike later neoclassical economists who said we can assume utility maximization everywhere, particularly on the basis of self-regarding preferences quite often, including in the family and so on. But they had another view which introduced this, uh, this uh, Max U, selfish Max U version. Be Becker, as I say, goes further, claimed the mechanics of all individual maximization applies generally to all social interactions. Both approaches, however, don't play the role of moral motivation in economics, other than a simple utilitarian view. Who do we look to? Well, this guy, I think very much so. Moral sentiments, which actually was read by Darwin. Uh, his notebook suggests he read it, but we have no evidence that Darwin read uh, The Wealth of Nations. He did, it seems, however, read moral sentiments, and we can see similarities in both the language and also the inspiration taken from Smith in Darwin's own writing. Doesn't clinch the argument, but that seems to be some evidence that uh, Smith influenced Darwin. This is a famous quote, how selfish shall ever man be supposed, and to a degree we all selfish. There are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render the happiness necessary to him, though he deserved nothing from it except the pleasure. But that that could be fitted into a utilitarian framework. But we know that Smith was not a strict, at least a strict utilitarian, and he goes further than that to take a different tack. Um, and, and for example here, nature has not abandoned us entirely to the delusion of self-love. Our continual observations upon the conduct of others insensibly lead us to form to ourselves certain general rules concerning what is fit and proper to be done or to be voided. And it is thus that the general rules of morality are formed. So um, this is not just one passage from Smith. In both of his big books, Moral Sentiments and The Net Wealth of Nations, Smith talks about justice, he talks about the importance of justice in government, um, in the management of trade, and so on and so forth. Um, so, so Smith is not a narrow utilitarian at all. So this is implications of economics in several areas, I would suggest. A um, number of people, uh, Ian Willem, maybe in the audience, I don't know, I haven't looked at the list. Um, his work with Peter Richardson on the firm nature of the firm brings in issues about human dispositions, evolved human dispositions, and moral ones are, are included in that story. Um, a colleague of uh, Dick Langlois, uh, who's here, I think, uh, Lance Minkler, published a nice book on moral sentiments inside the firm. In other words, firms are, of course, objects of competition and the market can be moral claim. Second, that uh, creates dispositions towards profit maximization, maybe above most other things. But on the other hand, as these authors show us, uh, cooperation and, um, uh, and uh, morally motivated behavior to some degree are essential also for firms at the same time. So that's one area where the richness of human motivation beyond narrow max U concerns can be important. Health economics is another area. Um, we, we know that uh, Smith teaches us that the importance of sympathy. I would suggest that sympathy is also very important in health economics in explaining the motivation of health workers, including doctors, nurses, and so on. Uh, so in other words, focus uh, policies or analyses on, on health which focus 
largely or exclusively on profit or price measures, that can be important. But if, they, if you ignore the other elements in the story, then I think the, the one can argue about deficiencies in that case. Also, economic policies to deal with climate change. I mean, uh, um, it's 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 right and appropriate that we make we create pecuniary and other incentives for people to change their behaviours in a way uh, that we can help to deal with problems, uh, CO2 emissions, pollution and so on. But also I think we need to have a moral, a moral campaign as well. And I'd want to say, well, uh, even if it means that our standard of living may have to go down a bit, um, we, we, we deserve, we have, must, should do this, we have a duty to do this, because of our uh, uh, legacy, we hand to future generations. We have a we are stewards of the earth, and we have a duty, therefore, to um, act in this way. So that's beyond a simple utility maximizing uh, view of what's necessary. Again, I mean, incentives, uh, narrow incentives, are also important as well. But we can add the importance of other motivations. Public choice too. Um, big discussion among the motivations of politicians. I have no doubt that many politicians are greedy, self-interested, um, and so on and so forth, uh, just out for themselves and uh, develop policies that um, favour their group rather than anybody else. Um, that's true. I can find them many examples in Britain. I won't name names, but uh, that's very commonplace. But also, there is also evidence that people have wider motivations. In, in, in public service, and I think we should take those into account as well. Thank you very much.